I'm Ethan Heilman from Commonwealth Crypto and Boston University. Um, Nicolas Dorlier from DigiLab, uh, working around and Bitcoin, which is a C Sharp library and uh, BTC Pay, that is an open source payment processor for Bitcoin. Uh, and today we're going to be talking to you about uh, atomic swaps, um, both cross blockchain and uh, uh, privacy providing. So, so when I say atomic swaps, um, what do I mean? Well, at a very high level, this idea is that it enables Alice and Bob to trade some cryptocurrency but they shouldn't be able to cheat each other. Um, and the big part of not being able to cheat each other is that this trade is atomic. So either the trade doesn't go through or it does go through, but it never goes half through. So if you imagine two people, they come together, one person wants um, Bitcoin, one person wants Litecoin. Well, if it goes through halfway, someone gets their Bitcoin, but the other person doesn't get their Litecoin. Um, uh, so this atomic property is basically the property that states that they can't um, cheat each other uh, because the trade either fully goes through or it doesn't go through. Um, and I'll be saying that a lot today. Um, we wanna do this without a trusted third party. Um, in a lot of trades uh, in the real world, the way in which you achieve this property is that you have some uh, party that uh, you both give your things to and then it swaps them and gives them out and it ensures fairness, but with blockchains, we can do this without a trusted third party. In, in essence, the blockchain is acting as the third party. So, as I said before, either the trade occurs or both parties get their coins back. Um, and we're gonna assume that the parties are malicious, that they're gonna do all sorts of crafty things to try to cheat each other. Um, uh, so this, this protocol should, should work in the presence of um, malicious participants. So we're gonna talk about two different use cases uh, here today. Um, the first use case is, uh, is a cross-chain atomic swap, which is an atomic swap in which um, someone has one cryptocurrency, uh, Alice has one cryptocurrency, and Bob has another cryptocurrency. In this case, Alice has Litecoin, wants Bitcoin. Bob has Bitcoin and wants Litecoin. Um, so our protocol will be a protocol which allows Alice to trade Bob two Litecoin for one Bitcoin. So as you can see up there, Alice is sending Bob Litecoin, Bob is sending Alice Bitcoin. And please feel free to stop me with any questions uh, you have. Um, another use case is uh, using atomic swaps for privacy. Um, so for instance, uh, Alice, this is her transaction graph. So these transactions are all spending each other. Um, and if she spent, if she gave some money to that red, in that red transaction, so she paid some third party in that red transaction, that third party can see that out of that same transaction, she paid, she paid someone else. Um, so there's a privacy leak um, based on the uh, Alice, uh, based on anyone's transaction graph in, say, Bitcoin or Litecoin. Um, and so in this case, what we're interested in doing is Alice and Bob are using the same cryptocurrency. This isn't cross-chain trading, but what they're trading is um, outputs of the same value um, to provide privacy. So let's say we do an atomic swap. Um, Alice trades this output to Bob, Bob trades this output to Alice, and a third party looking at the transaction graph would assume that this is actually Alice's, um, that this is actually a transaction that's connected with Alice, but it's not, it's a transaction that's connected with Bob. They've switched transaction outputs. So that's the second use case we'll be looking at. So let's look at a, a very simple atomic swap. This is an atomic swap within the same blockchain. So we start, Alice has a, a transaction, transaction one, it's already been confirmed on the blockchain. Um, and uh, the way in which we're gonna represent the fact that she has an output, which is controlled by her public key, is this little black square that has a Bitcoin. 
So that Bitcoin is locked under Alice's private key. It needs a signature from Alice's secret key to move those coins. Um, and the same thing is true for Bob. He has a transaction. He has some Bitcoins locked in um, his uh, public key. Um, he, uh, signatures need to be signed to move them out of that output. So Alice says to Bob, hey, Bob, do you want to swap some Bitcoins? Bob says, yes, I have uh, coins in transaction two. Um, and so Alice creates this transaction three, which spends both of the outputs. Um, notice is not signed yet. Um, she's just created this transaction. And then it has two outputs, um, which spend to, um, one of them spends to Bob and one of them spends to Alice. Now, in this example, I've drawn it where um, Alice and, uh, they use the same um, public key. Um, you wouldn't actually want to use the same public key in, uh, for a privacy application um, because that would reveal, that, that would reveal the, the, the path that the coins moved. Um, but for this very simple um, atomic swap, we're just, we're just making it atomic. Um, and so there's an output controlled by Bob's public key and an output controlled by Alice's public key. Um, uh, we need signatures to make this valid. So Alice signs this transaction and sends it to Bob. Bob also signs transaction three, um, making transaction three valid. It can be posted on the blockchain. Um, and, uh, and notice that this is, that this is atomic. This satisfies our atomicity property. Um, either transaction three is confirmed or it's not confirmed. So the trade happens, uh, so this trade happens uh, atomically. Um, uh, however, we can't use this protocol if, um, tr if Alice and Bob are on different blockchains, if they want to do cross-chain trading, um, because you can't construct this transaction three and have it be on two blockchains simultaneously. Does that make sense to everyone? Does anybody have any questions on that? Sure. So you gain no, no privacy in this. Um, you would gain privacy if Alice here had chosen a different public key and Bob had chosen a different public key, they would have privacy. Um, but this demonstration is just a really, really simple atomic trade. So if I understand your question correctly, um, you're saying that say, if this was like 0.2 Bitcoins and that was like five Bitcoins, you would be able to um, tell the output values. And that's, that's, a, that's an excellent point um, and something that we should always consider with privacy protocols. Many of the early Bitcoin privacy protocols were broken by exactly that attack. Um, so this would only provide privacy if one, the public keys were different and two, the output amounts were the, the same. Um, with something like confidential transactions, that would not need to be the case, but we're talking um, Bitcoin here. Um, so you would definitely need the outputs to be the same amount. Great question. Uh, excuse me, sure. I don't understand why, how can we gain the pro privacy if another pro provide uh, another public address? So if I understand what you're asking, you're saying um, if Alice chose another public key, how would this provide privacy? Yes. Um, it would provide some privacy where it wouldn't be immediately obvious that this was an output controlled by Alice. It could be an output controlled by Bob. If, if both parties chose different private keys, you wouldn't be able to tell which output was connected to which participant. You'd know it would be connected to one of the two participants, but you wouldn't know which one. Oh, okay, I got it, thank you. Um, so this is actually a really simple uh, um, version of uh, CoinJoin, and we'll return to this protocol and, and look at how it provides privacy. All right, so we're gonna look at a non-atomic uh, cross-blockchain trade. Um, before we get to atomic ones, I'm going to show you one that's, that's broken. 
Um, so Alice says to Bob, um, want to trade Litecoin for Bitcoin? Bob says, yes. Um, send me your Litecoin first and I'll send you some Bitcoin. Um, so what Alice does is she posts a transaction on the Litecoin blockchain, um, which uh, sends Litecoin to Bob. Uh, notice that it's uh, Bob's public key there. Um, now Bob has his Litecoin. Um, and if he's honest, he can post a transaction on the Bitcoin blockchain, giving Alice the agreed amount, amount of Bitcoin. Um, but this is actually uh, not atomic for fairly obvious reasons. Um, Alice uh, can't cheat Bob in this setting, so it's fine uh, if Alice is untrusted. But if Bob is malicious, um, Bob, Bob can definitely cheat Alice. And the way in which Bob cheats Alice is uh, Bob just doesn't post transaction four. He could spend this money back to himself, so he gets Alice's uh, Litecoin um, and does not give Alice any Bitcoin. Um, so the way in which we're gonna prevent this is with um, hash locks. Uh, people in the room may be familiar with um, HTLCs, um, and that's essentially what we're, we're going to use here. So, a hash lock is a requirement you place on a transaction such that to spend a transaction output, you must provide a value X such that the hash of X equals Y. So in Bitcoin, this could be something like op hash 160 or um, uh, hash uh, 256, um, some sort of hash where you're relying on the, it being hard to discover the preimage of the, hard to discover what X is. So here's a simple example of a hash lock. Um, Alice chooses a random value X and hashes it to get some value Y. Um, she then creates a transaction uh, whose output is locked under two, uh, is under uh, two conditions. The first condition is that it needs a signature from Bob. And the second condition is that the transaction, with the input that spends it must also provide an X such that the hash of X equals Y. Um, so if Bob learns the value X, Bob can spend transaction one um, by uh, using Bob's uh, secret key to generate a signature and also providing X. So we can use this to now do an atomic cross-chain trade. And the idea here is that Alice is gonna choose a random value X um, and she's going to hash it to get Y um, and she's gonna post transaction, transaction one. She's not gonna tell anyone what X is at this point. She keeps X as a secret. Um, uh, Bob waits for transaction one to be confirmed and then post transaction two. Um, now transaction two, Bob doesn't know what X is, um, but Bob knows that if he learns the value X, he can claim money over in transaction one. So Bob, Bob knows that this is safe to do because the only way Alice can take money out of transaction two is by revealing X. And if Bob learns X, which he could learn from what's spending it, Bob gains the ability to go over to transaction one. Um, so Alice waits for transaction two to be confirmed and then posts uh, transaction three, um, which reveals X. Um, this grants Bob the ability because now Bob can extract X from transaction three. Um, to spend the money on the other side of this um, and get his Litecoin. And so this, this, is, uh, in the this is the simplest version of um, an atomic swap. Uh, Alice has swapped Litecoin for Bitcoin. So Alice gets Bitcoin out here. Bob gets Litecoin out, even though he put Bitcoin in. Um, and they use this hash pre-image to ensure that they can, um, to, in to make the transaction atomic. So notice that um, if, if uh, Alice doesn't spend this money, then Bob can't claim, um, can't claim the Litecoins uh, from transaction one. Um, but like what happens if, Al if Alice or Bob, um, or what happens if Alice just goes away? She never, she never posts this. Well, now Bob's money is just locked for forever. Um, you know, that's not really great for Bob. But like Alice, you can kind of blame, uh, blame Alice because like uh, she set this up and then she went away, but like, Bob, Bob was trying to do a trade and now his funds are locked basically forever. Um, so we need to add an additional condition called the time lock. 
um, which will refund the coins after some time limit is reached. Sure. Why does uh, why does why does transaction uh, three have to happen? Why why can't um, Alice just give the pre-image X to Bob so that in the future he may spend uh, those coins? Um, so Alice, if uh, Alice could give the pre-image to Bob, mm -hmm. um, uh, however Alice wants her coins, um, so she wants to post this transaction um, at some point. Um, but conceivably, uh, she could give it to Bob and then like post it. Like maybe she she's not sure what output she wants to spend this to, and so she gives X to Bob, and then later in like you know two hours, she's like, oh, actually, I want to send this money over here, and then post this transaction. Um, but we're assuming that these are mutually untrusting uh, parties. The expression goes like, you know, Bitcoin is the currency of enemies, um, and so. Uh, like Alice only releases this to get her money, but she could totally tell Bob about it. And when we actually build these protocols, um, uh, often we may just tell, like I'll, if this was say happening inside of a payment channel, um, Alice wouldn't have to actually show Bob this transaction, she'd just have to provide the free image um, and then she could post it at her leisure. Great question. So we add, we add um, time locks which are an additional condition, which says that after a period of time has passed, um, uh, both parties can take their money out of these transactions. So if Alice never posts transaction three, never tells Bob uh, what X is, um, Bob can take his money back and Alice can take her money back. Um, and this is what's known as the Tier Noland Atomic Trade Protocol, um, like what I've just showed you with the uh, um, time locks. All right, so what this looks like is either, um, remember before I said atomic swaps provide either the trade happens or it doesn't happen, but it never halfway happens. So this is, this is what Tier Nolan provides. Either the trade happens, um, Bob gets the Litecoins, Alice gets the Bitcoins, or the trade doesn't happen and both of them get their refunds um, and get their money back. Um, Bitcoin has, uh, two different types of uh, time locks. Um, it has, uh, actually, I, I guess it has three, but we're gonna talk about um, two. Um, there's uh, check lock time verify um, and check sequence verify. Um, in this talk, we're gonna just talk about check lock time verify. Um, check sequence verify allows you to do relative time locks, so like relative to when a transaction's posted. Um, whereas check lock time verify allows you to do absolute time lock. So this transaction um, uh, can be reclaimed at this specific block height or this specific timestamp. Um, and I think there's something that's important to note about this protocol is that um, uh, Alice goes last. So Alice can decide, Alice has the ability to decide whether the trade happens or a refund happens. Um, so you could imagine um, uh, Alice could say like, look at like, if this time lock is say like three days, Alice could look at the market and decide, oh, this trade's not gonna make me any money or oh, this trade's gonna make me a lot of money. Um, uh, so you do wanna be careful who you're, who you're trading with. Um, they can't steal your money, but Alice can adversarially choose to have the trade happen or not happen. All right, so um, I'm gonna show this with, uh, uh, block height, um, because it's easier to show with block height. Um, uh, but the the time locks, um, you probably would want to do, they can either do block height, or they can do um, uh, block time, which is like the timestamp inside the block. Um, block height's actually uh, fairly risky to do um, for, uh, for different uh, blockchains, um, because they, the, the mining levels may increase or decrease in unexpected ways. Um, and it's really important that Alice's refund happens after Bob's refund. Um, if, if, the, if Alice's refund happens before Bob's refund, um, it's no longer uh, safe. Alice, Alice can cheat Bob. Um, so, we, uh, so to uh, keep these in sync, 
um, it makes more sense to use uh, block time than to use block height. So let's go through the protocol again. Um, Alice, uh, Alice spends the output uh, with her signature in X. Bob then learns X, uses it to spend the output with his signature in X, um, and the trade happens. Um, or the trade doesn't happen, um, in which case uh, both parties are refunded. At this point, Bob can post his refund, and then at this later point, Alice can post her refund. Um, but as I said, Alice's time lock must be greater than Bob's or she can cheat. So what happens if Alice's time lock is the same as Bob's, for instance? Well, um, uh, and ig ignore this uh, transaction for here. Um, so Alice can post, uh, can post her refund and get her money back. And Alice can also claim the funds in here um, because the, the refunds happen at the same time. Um, she can post this transaction and the refund transaction simultaneously. So she'll get her money out of transaction one, um, but Bob will uh, not get, get his refund back because this output has been spent by transaction three. Um, so it's extremely important that, it, that Alice's refund happens after Bob's refund. All right. Um, so do you want to do this, or do we want to talk about Maxwell swaps first? Uh, I can abort it, but I All right. will talk about it later. Um, so actually, for the I, I made a proof of concept of the tier null one protocol like two years ago, something like this, um, and I tried to explain basically what's the process when uh, two party want to I don't know. Exchange, for example. Uh, so in my example, in my proof of concept, it was two blockchain based on Bitcoin that I called BTCA, BTCB. Uh, you can say like it's BTC and LTC, for example. And the process was the following. So there was Bob that was giving his public key to Alice. Then Alice from this could create an offer uh, to Bob, let's say, okay, let's swap this amount of Bitcoin against this amount of Litecoin, and uh, here is my hash, uh, hash, and uh, my public keys. So both people get enough information to create uh, to create the transactions. So the the, the escrow that uh, Ethan presented you. Um, so what will happen basically is that uh, there, there, there was, um, so on one side, there was what I was calling the offer transaction that was signed by Alice. And on the other side, there was a Bob transaction that is signed by Bob. And as Ethan explained you, basically the script to unlock one BTCA, for example, it was that Bob sign or Bob know that the secret that only at least know, or maybe there is a timeout because Bob disappear and like Alice can get back the money. And same thing for Bob, like, but the other way. Uh, then they were, we, you, we needed to wait confirmations. Uh, if I remember, actually, this slide is a bit wrong. I needed to do it in specific. Uh, no, actually, that was fine. This part was fine. So boss wait the confirmation. And uh, after the confirmation, then they can uh, exchange uh, the hashes. So like Alice will try to grab uh, the, the coin of Bob. By doing so, she reveal her secrets, and then Bob can do the same. Um, so this is what the script looks like. Uh, so we, we, we didn't have a big uh, session about how Bitcoin script work, but yeah, the, the, those both scripts basically explain like on which side uh, of the conditional placed. 
Um, for people that want to play with scripts, uh, also I I have a link. Uh, actually, I can show you. Maybe uh, wait. Uh, you don't have a keyboard. Uh, mouse. Uh, wait. Yeah, I may, I, may, I may do later. But basically, with this, um, I, I have a link that you can see below that you can browse and you can change the script, adjust the script, and run it by yourself so you can play a bit with the scripts if you want. Um, OK, so I let you do the, this, this part. And then uh, after, I will, I, I'd like to present you the Maxwell protocol after that is a small improvement about uh, atomic swap and on which I'm developing right now another proof of concept that is uh, that has a real UI so I can show you later just after this uh, unfortunately I started last week it's still not complete you know I was very confident to be able to make it and uh, until uh, this morning at, at uh, 1 a.m. I was pretty confident to make it uh, sadly, I didn't have enough coffee to keep me awake up at night, but at least I can show you uh, something more uh, tangible, uh, how it looks like from user experience just after this. Um, so yeah, in a summary, uh, like with the channel on protocol, like no party can cheat each other's we need to be careful about the, the time locks, as, uh, as Ethan explained. And um, we can, uh, the only requirement actually we tried with Bitcoin and Litecoin, but actually the only requirement as far as cryptocurrencies are concerned is like we have that the cryptocurrency support hash, uh, hash locks and time locks, which is in, I think quite all of them do, I think, if I'm not wrong. Um, so yeah, it, it's also for blockchain transactions. Uh, yeah. So there is, um, so there is a point as well for people to do uh, atomic swap on the sa same chain, like, exchange some Bitcoin against some Bitcoin to somebody else. And in fact, the, the one of the reason will be just to, uh, it's sort of a coin join actually, where um, somebody looking the blockchain, uh, so for example here, uh, maybe I will let you explain this actually because on the color I'm not comfortable, but yeah, thank you. Um, so uh, as we as we showed earlier, um, you can do you can use this for uh, hiding um, uh, uh, hiding transaction graph relationships. Um, we're going to discuss two protocols. One is a very simple um, single transaction coin join, and the second protocol is Maxwell's coin swap. Um, so remember before when I said that we need different uh, public keys to provide privacy. Um, this is, uh, this is that version of the protocol. Um, Alice chooses a new public key, Bob chooses a new public key for their output. Um, as long as the inputs are, have the same amounts, um, you shouldn't be able to tell which output um, is Alice's and which output is Bob's. So uh, from a probability point of view, um, uh, if you, the probability that you were to guess correctly would be um, like one half, basically a coin flip. And uh, this is Maxwell's um, coin swap protocol. So rather than um, starting with the coins just controlled by Alice or just controlled by Bob, we now imagine that they um, put their coins into uh, two of two multi-sig um, outputs. So that is um, uh, transaction one, uh, the coins are controlled by um, uh, Bob's public key and Alice's public key. Um, uh, although they're using different different public keys in the transactions, um, and transaction two controlled by Bob's public key and Alice's public key. Um, since Alice put her coins into transaction one, 
Um, if nothing happens, she gets them out. Um, but let's look at the case in which um, they spend. So uh, as before, they um, both sign transactions, which say uh, if the value x is released, then, um, uh, then this can be spent by Alice. And if, the value, uh, and if the value x is known by Bob, it can be spent by Bob. Um, so they sign both of these transactions, and then Alice releases um, uh, transaction six, which, which spends this. Um, but notice that transaction six is, um, these haven't been confirmed yet, right? So these are, these are off-chain. Um, and as the question was asked before, um, couldn't Alice just send um, X? Uh, she could. Um, and the way that this protocol would work is that optimistically, Alice, Alice might construct this transaction privately, um, but she doesn't send it to Bob. She just tells Bob about X, um, and then when Bob is happy, um, they move on. Um, now, if one of the parties uh, defected and tried to, tried to go to the blockchain, um, of course, Alice would post this transaction, but she doesn't actually have to construct it and send it to Bob for Bob to learn the value X. Um, So what they end up doing is they construct this all off blockchain. And they know that if the other party tries to cheat, they can just post these, um, these transactions and they are, they're safe. So they don't actually need to post these transactions. Once they've, um, once they've uh, constructed all of this and learned to value X, instead they just construct a simple transaction that pays out to um, Alice and pays out to Bob. Um, they both sign these transactions, and then they post them instead. Um, and then all of these transactions have refunds in case, say, Bob were to adversarially post transaction three. Um, the parties whose money is locked in there need their, need their money out. Um, so we need refund transactions for transaction three, uh, transaction two, transaction one, and transaction four. Um, but note that this provides a lot of privacy because um, all that shows up is uh, transaction two and transaction seven and transaction one and transaction eight. Um, uh, so this saves money on fees because you don't have to post these intermediate transactions. Um, and this can also provide privacy because you're not able to, because you can't see X, you're not able to directly link the atomic swap happening. You do have some additional information that, that does provide an ability to um, maybe guess that Alice and Bob did an atomic swap um, because uh, you see this multi-sig uh, address, you see this um, output, and you see these two things uh, related by time on the blockchain. So if you were to um, uh, make the assumption that they were doing an atomic swap, um, you might be able to then say, like, we think these two transactions are related, but you don't have that same level. So one, if a lot of people were doing this at the same time, um, and there's a protocol built around this called uh, Zim um, to provide uh, privacy on, on Bitcoin, um, where it coordinates a whole bunch of these happening at the same time. Um, so if a lot of these were happening at the same time, you wouldn't be able to tell who was swapping with who. Um, but even still, if, you know, there are other cases other than um, uh, Maxwell's uh, coin swaps that are using multi-sig. Um, so you wouldn't, be, you wouldn't be sure that this was actually a atomic swap that was occurring. Uh, you, would just, you would just see this. Um, a, a third party would just see, see that. Um, and additionally, you can take Maxwell's um, coin swaps and generalize this to payment channels. So, <laughs> Um, as before, uh, everything is locked up in two of two multi-sigs. Um, they perform the protocol that I just showed you where they do a coin swap. Um, but rather than post the final transactions they're going to post on the blockchain, um, they could just perform another coin swap but transfer some more coins. And so they could actually, um, in real time, uh, decide, like, oh, I'm going to trade, like, two Litecoins for Bitcoin, and then later 
like based on the price. Actually, I'm going to trade four Litecoins for Bitcoin and keep this like running tally, um, and then uh, like finally close out the last state. So you can use this to perform more than one trade um, inside of uh, once you set up these two of two uh, multi-sig transactions. So, uh, in summary, for the privacy. Maxwell's coin swaps provide um, uh, are indistinguishable from four multi-sig transactions on different blockchains. Um, they can be correlated by price, timing, uh, network information. If you're monitoring the network, you might be able to find and more information. But they are strictly more private than um, if you were to expose the pre-image. Um, there are several other atomic swap-based privacy protocols. Um, uh, one I already mentioned is uh, Zim. Um, and then there is also uh, Tumblebit, um, which uh, is, has some of the same properties, but relies on a very different uh, mechanism. Rather than using uh, pre-images, it uses uh, signatures in a way that you can't link the pre-images together. All right, so what we covered so far was um, Simple trading protocols. Um, so trades that only trust one party. Um, atomic trades that work uh, across one blockchain. Then we showed how to do uh, cross-chain atomic swaps. Um, uh, introduced the tier Nolan atomic uh, trade protocol. Um, and then showed how to do uh, two-party coin joins um, and how to use atomic swaps for privacy. Um, if anyone has any uh, questions. Thank you very much for your talk. Um, the big question I think with atomic swaps uh, has to deal with decentralized exchanges and price, price discovery. Um, like you were saying, uh, Alice could wait for the lock time period and at the end say, I'm going to lose money on this trade, so I won't do it, or I will, I will do it, like you were saying. Um, so I know that um, uh, with, with the company that you work for, that you guys are working on decentralized exchanges and, and trying to kind of get that uh, price discovery problem uh, of atomic swaps kind of solved. And I was just wondering, what are your thoughts on that aspect of the whole kind of atomic swaps trading and, and things like that? And whether or not, you know, the community and, you know, organizations that you've talked to have kind of talked about how they would solve that problem? Sure. Um, so uh, let's see if I understand your question. So you're, you're asking about um, this problem where uh, uh, since Alice goes last, she can choose whether the trade goes through or not. Um, and this gives uh, Alice some ability to um, kind of like game the system to her own benefit. Um, so, so as you alluded to, um, I'm working on a company doing atomic swaps. Um, uh, we're, we're very concerned with this problem. So the approach that we've taken to solve it um, is that we work uh, with uh, centralized exchanges to do, um, uh, to have them manage the price discovery um, and these nice, highly liquid order books. Um, and because we are a um, trustless but centralized party, um, if we start behaving in that way, it will be like very obvious. Um, so we attempt to solve it with um, incentives um, versus, say, if you were to find someone on like IRC or on the internet to do an atomic swap with, that party may. Um, there's not really like much you can do if they start doing these like wait and see games. And they're very much incentivized to do the wait and see games. So the approach we've tried to solve it is by just having one party that everyone trades with, and that party has access to a lot of liquidity in um, centralized order books. Uh, a follow-up question? Sure. So um, judging by the fact that you guys took that approach of, of approaching centralized exchanges to kind of solve the price uh, discovery problem, um, was there some sort of uh, information that you might have gathered that might be useful to everyone about uh, the current decentralized exchange protocols that are out there? Like, did you look into all of them and think they were not good enough? Or 
it, like what was the research that went into the decentralized exchange uh, protocols that led you to believe, okay, we need to go to the centralized exchanges and get their order books instead of doing something else? Uh, so, so when we looked at it, um, I, I think it's just, it's a, it's a different set of trade-offs. Um, so far, the advantage with decentralized exchanges is that you don't need to do um, KYC or, or that's the sort of presumed wisdom. Um, but you, um, you have these risks about who your counterparties are because you're doing peer-to-peer -peer trading. Um, and there's a risk of uh, front running. So people have, um, there's, there's been a lot of front running in the decentralized exchanges. Um, miners can reorder transactions. And um, so uh, you gain this ability to not have to be KYC'd, which is a benefit. Um, but along with that are some disadvantages. So we decide to go in the opposite direction um, where users would have to be um, uh, KYC'd, but they wouldn't be open um, to these, uh, these sorts of problems, um, some of which are just lack of liquidity um, and also these, uh, these front-running risks, uh, these increased front-running risks that you often see at decentralized exchanges. Okay, thank you very much. Thanks. Okay, I just wanted to add something. Uh, as long as privacy is concerned, um, actually, we can simplify uh, this protocol by getting rid of the time locks if SegWit is supported by the chain because you can pre-sign the refund transactions. So I think this is pretty big because like, there is lots of multisig on the chain, but this kind of transaction like stand out. Uh, so yeah, it's, it's, a, it's an improvement. Another improvement can come um, I'm very hopeful with uh, improvements so on um, on uh, what Blockstream is working, confidential transactions. So imagine what the, the second chain is using, for example, confidential asset or confidential transactions. The value that you receive on the other chain is completely private. So actually, after you just have the timing information that is leaking. So it's, uh, I think it's pretty exciting from privacy point of view. Um, and last thing, actually, I wanted just to show you a quick demo uh, about an example. Uh, we still have time, <laughs> five minutes. So a quick demo about uh, about an example of cross chain atomic swap uh, from the user perspective. Uh, so wait. Okay, so from an, a user experience uh, perspective, uh, if I want to do a cross-chain atomic swap without price discovery, you know, just peer-to-peer, -peer, like I talk with you, you say, okay, I have some Litecoin. On my side, I have some Bitcoin. We agreed on a fixed rate. Uh, then what the, the process from the UX perspective is uh, so the market maker, uh, there, there's two kind of two person. What once I one, one person I call the market maker, the other one that is called the market taker. So the market maker is basically defining the term of the of the offer. So like you know which how much on each side. Uh, then he will, once he created this sort of offer, then he can share the link to the offer to the other party. The other party then can verify that the offer is what he, uh, what he agree for, then he accepts the offer, then both pay the escrow. So I'm assuming that we are doing a Maxwell uh, uh, atomic swap, wait confirmations, and then they can exchange the, hash the hashes and broadcast the results. So, uh, okay. So I did not finish this. I thought that one week was enough to, for me to finish it. I, I was, you know, like every developer out there, a bit optimistic about my, my time schedule. But uh, at least it can show you what will come very soon. Um, so 
It's not about BTC Bay, BTC Bay so I, I did a payment processor, and basically I will implement Atomic Swap on it. And the way it works is like on your left, there is uh, a Bitcoin wallet. Uh, I mean, a uh, peer with two Bitcoin, uh, two wallets, one Bitcoin wallet and one Litecoin wallet. And the other side, there is one with only Litecoin wallets. Uh, uh, I mean, uh, they, who have some Litecoins. And I am assuming the left guy, uh, let's call her Alice, is a market taker. So she wants to create an offer of one Bitcoin against 10 Litecoin, for example. So she will go in her wallet. Uh, here there is a tab, Atomic Swap, make a BTC offer because she's selling BTC. She will receive, she wants to receive Litecoin or no wallet on, in her wallet. So she selects, okay, I want the LTC wallet in destination. She say, I want 10 Litecoin, like one BTC. Um, actually here she can put like an exchange rate if she prefer, but like I will keep it simple right now. Then she gets a link here that she can share, di share directly with somebody else. So let's say this somebody else is Bob on the right. So from Bob perspective, um, what Bob want to do is to take this offer, so he will go in his BTC wallet, atomic swap, take a BTC offer. So copy paste the link that Alice give him. Then receive the Bitcoin on his wallet, so I call this wallet Bob, accept. Ooh, no crash. Ooh. So um, here there is like the address of the escrow to which uh, Bob must stand. And actually from the user's perspective, so this is a port where still to be done. <laughs> but uh, from the user's perspective, Bob only then need to, uh, yeah, Bob only need to send 10 BTC to this address. And on Alice's side, she has also our escrow address here. So they both have to send money to this address. And then the two instances will communicate together to exchange the hashes and like make the swap a reality. So I think that from the user's perspective, it can be quite simple. Uh, I'm still you know, thinking a lot about this, trying to make it as simple as possible. Uh, but I hope that this month at least I will have something uh, complete uh, to show and, and uh, to, to run in prod, ready to pro run in productions. Um, so one thing to note is that very often the conversation between atomic swap and this uh, come together with decentralized exchange. On my side, I think it's putting the courage before the horses. So. If we, can do, we, we don't have proper wallets to do uh, atomic swap, I think talking of decentralized exchange is a bit premature. That's why I'm trying to build this easy tool that don't assume a decentralized exchange. Uh, and that's about it uh, that I wanted to say. Yes. So is there any question? Thank you very much for the talk. So actually I have two questions. The first one is about the escrow. So is this from the service provider? Can you can consider is it a service provider? And in that case, how can you differentiate this one from the centralized exchange? Oh, you, you mean the address? Or can yes. I differentiate? Is it the, oh. is okay. this the escrow, escrow's address or is the address of okay. Bob and Alice in this? So in this particular case, it works fine because like, uh, so I didn't, in, I, I didn't introduce BTC Pay, but BTC Pay is basically an open source payment processor. And I'm assuming that Alice and Bob have their own instance. 
So like they're trusting this server because it's their own server. Ah. So that's why they can trust that this one is a scroll, except if I put a, I have a bug in my code, of course. So that is the address of the user or the address of the scroll? This is the address of the scroll. Okay. So you, you cannot, but visually you cannot, uh, you cannot know the difference. You can only be sure it's an escrow because you trust my server, basically. Ah, okay. So it, I mean, in this case, you trust the uh, escrow. So I've, to I, me, I, I feel like it's not so different from the centralized no, no, chain. No, no, no. So it's not, uh, so um, let me rephrase it. So this address that you are showing, it's calculated from my server BTC Pay. Ah. I'm assuming that Alice and Bob have their own server. Okay, that, oh, okay, so like, okay. as long as they trust the code that is running on their server, then they can trust that this is indeed an escrow. Ah, okay, I got but it. But you, you are right in the fact that uh, if it was a third party website, maybe I'm just lying and like, it's not an escrow actually. Okay, thank you. And I have another question about, as you know, I think it's not, uh, it's the common issue of the decentralized chain, but, uh, the price very volatile, as you know. So it maybe yeah. uh, in the example, at least have right to reject, uh, to cancel the offer, right? The maker, if she's a maker. So yeah. do you have any idea how to address? Like if the price going very well in the next 10 minutes, he take the offer or like he, uh, he or she cancels yeah. the offer in this case, is there any like idea? Yeah, so uh, this is a good question. So. In this particular case, it's not as difficult as if you wanted to do an exchange, because if you want to do a decentralized exchange, indeed you have this kind of problem of where people can game the system. But here I'm like, you know, a layer below where people manually say, you know, I meet you in a, con uh, in a conference, you say, okay, I want to give you some BTC, RTC. It's not there is a kind of trust, but like if you, if you decide, oh, the price is too bright till late change, I will say, okay, I w don't want to deal anymore with this person. So it's more like peer-to-peer -peer directly. So ah, okay. there's not so much issue, but for, from his perspective, it's different. So I think he wants to respond. Right. Thank you for the question. Oh, thank you for the question. Um, so uh, volatility is a, is a very big concern. Um, and so, uh, the, the approach that um, uh, we've taken at Commonwealth Crypto is because um, uh, is to do these inside of payment channels where the user gets a quote um, and then the user agrees um, to if that quote is is goes through the user will be happy um, they're given say a period of time to decide say like 15 seconds um, uh, and then the exchange, uh, the exchange is sort of the last party. So the exchange says like, um, all right, you've agreed within the 15 seconds, I'm gonna execute the trade, or I'm not gonna um, execute the trade, you've taken longer than 15 seconds. Um, and so that allows these trades to be um, uh, done um, uh, without that much concern of uh, volatility. Um, many exchanges offer an order type called RFQ a request for quote that fits very much within that. And so they have algorithms for um, predicting where the volatility is gonna go within short periods of time, like 10 to 15 seconds. Um, and so they can actually like know that they will be happy um, if the user accepts the trade uh, regard, like because they've placed limits on how much the volatility should move with like a certain degree of confidence. Okay, so it's like you have the preset of rule like how uh, for the range of the volatility they can take the offer or reject the offer or something like that, is this correct? Right. So the exchange goes last, so the exchange can accept the offer or reject the offer. Um, uh, and so the user agrees to a, a price that the exchange quotes them and the exchange only quotes them that price because the algorithms that they've used to look at their order book um, say that that would be an acceptable price within the next like 10 to 15 seconds. Um, and because the exchange goes last, if uh, the exchange can back out, but the user can't. Um, so the user has to give like a thumbs up or thumbs down within that like 10 to 15 second window. Okay, I got it. Thank you very much. Thanks.
Okay, thanks a lot. Thank you.